Right, uh, good morning, um, everybody. Um, apologies, we are a few minutes late starting. Um, we've had a, a pre-meeting which ran over slightly. <coughs> so, uh, it's Friday the 16th of September, and um, welcome to the Countryside Rights of Way panel. We'll start, please, with uh, apologies. Yeah, good morning, Chairman. We've received apologies from Councillor Pritchard. Thank you. And item number two, please, declarations of interest in accordance with standing orders. Has anyone got any interests? No. Nope. Okay. Thank you. And we'll move straight into <coughs> item number four, which is the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, an application for two alleged footpaths leading off Sandon and Burston footpath uh, 25. Uh, are you going to take this one? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you haven't done the minutes. Apologies. I've, it's a good job we've got Zach, or I've got Zach. Um, could we have the minutes? Are they a true record record of the last meeting on the... Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and again, we'll move back on to item number four. Uh, would you give your presentation, please? Thank you. Good morning, Chair Members. This is a report concerning alleged public footpaths between Joelpool Lane and the B5027 at Oxter Road in Sandon. This is an application for two public footpaths, one footpath between Hardywick Road, which is more recently referred to as Joelpool Lane, to Sandon and Burston footpath 25, and a second footpath between Sandon and Burston footpath 25, and what was known as the Toxter Turnpike Road, which is now known as the Toxter Road, the B5027. The application was submitted by Mr. Martin Ray and the routes are marked A to B and C to D at Appendix B of the report. In support of the application for the addition of the footpaths, Mr. Ray included a traced copy of the Sandon Enclosure Award plan, together with excerpts of narrative from the Sandon Enclosure Award. As members will be aware, Enclosure Awards are legal documents created to record, redistribute or reorganise land. Pro uh, providing legal proof of historical ownership and the boundaries of land holdings. Your office has searched for other documentary evidence to support or oppose the enclosure award and plan. Your office has discovered the Sand and Enclosure Act of 1814. The Act, which received royal assent on 18th of May 1814, created legal property rights to land previously held in common. The Sandon Act provided the authority for the creation of the award. Your officers discovered a tithe map of the area, which was drafted approximately 25 to 35 years after the award. There is no trace of a route between parcels number 107 and 105, which is route A to B, and claimed route C to D did appear to come to an abrupt stop at field, field number 94. The tithe maps, therefore, did not provide any supporting evidence. With regard to weight of evidence, however, tithe maps do not show a legal creation of a right-of-way, just reputation of a way as a highway and the physical existence of a way. The Ordnance Survey Plans of 1887, I suspect, have not unfortunately been produced very clearly in the reports that you have received. Route A to B cannot, in your officer's opinion, be seen on clearer images of the maps, and Route C to D appear to head in a straight line between a third of the way to halfway across the field up to what we now know as the B5027. Ordnance survey maps, however, as with tithe, tithe maps, do not show a legal creation of a right-of-way, simply the physical existence of a way. Parish survey cards did not show any evidence of the claimed routes, although they are often of limited value and in themselves only used to support or oppose other evidence regarding routes. The report was sent for initial consultation on the 12th of August 2022 to the applicant and the landowner and his legal representatives, Charles Russell LLP, in both their Cheltenham and London offices for their comments. There was no response from the applicant. The landowner's representative in Sandon briefly contacted your officers, but in relation to a typographical error on the report's covering letter, which dot did not affect the evidence in any way and Charles Russell LLP in London contacted your offices to advise that it would be a matter for their Cheltenham offices. Nothing has been received from any of these parties. Sandon and Burston Parish Council were contacted. Their clerk, Hannah Marr, responded that members had read the information and had not raised any objections. 
Stafford Borough Council and County Councillor Ian Parry were also contacted for comments, although no responses have been received. With this application, there are two separate legal tests to each claimed path, one of which must be satisfied before a modification order can be made for each route. The first test is whether the evidence on the balance of probabilities show the right-of-way does subsist. The second test is whether the evidence shows that a public right-of-way can be reasonably alleged to subsist. On consideration of the evidence, the weight of the Enclosure Act and subsequent award are substantive of the existence of the routes in their own right, despite the lack of supporting evidence from other documentation. It is your officer's opinion that the application for the route point A to B and also the route C to D pass the test of being reasonably alleged to subsist under Section 53 3C1 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981. Your officer's recommendation, therefore, is that the two claim paths, both with the status of footpaths, both subsist. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any, any questions or comments from members? Paul? Thank you for the report. I mean, to me, the t big points really are that there's no objections either from the legal officers representing them. There's no objections from the landowners. Uh, the, the local councillors at any level haven't objected. Uh, so I, I believe we go with the report and uh, we accept the officer's recommendation. Proposal from Paul, seconded by Jill. Uh, thank you for the report, by the way. Uh, all those who are in favour of that recommendation? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, that's uh, passed and, and going forwards. Um, um, and we'll move on, please, to item number five, which is, uh, again, the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Um, it says 2981, but I presume it means um, uh, 1981. Just clarity, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and this is for... Uh, application for a public footpath from home, home close uh, across the field to an outer perimeter of Keel um, Golf Course. <coughs> uh, now I understand wh when we do the report that th there has been some um, correspondence from, from one of the local county councillors, but uh, I don't know if you could just confirm that. Thank you. Um, would you like to start the report, please? Thank you, Mr Chairman, members of the panel. This was another very interesting application relating to the addition of a public footpath around the outer perimeter or edge of Keel Golf Course. Again, I should confirm that the local member has endorsed your officer's recommendation not to accept the application and feels strongly that the route should not be added to the definitive map and statement. I'll move straight to the recommendation, which is that the officers believe there is not sufficient evidence to show that a right-of-way subsists or is reasonably alleged to subsist along the line claimed by the applicant and visible at Appendix B, and therefore that an order should not be made to add the route to the definitive map or statement for the Borough of Newcastle under line. Indeed, this is a somewhat curious application in that there is a significant disparity in the evidence and, as we will demonstrate, a total disconnection from the public highway. The application was submitted in 2011 by Mr Thomas Mellon and although described as an application to add a public footpath from home close across the field to the outer perimeter of Keel Golf Course, the application plan itself did not support this. Indeed, at Appendix E, you will see the op that officers sought confirmation of the line of the route directly with the applicant and that this was confirmed as shown. In this confirmation, the section crossing the field to home close was missing and it was also missing from several of the maps supplied with the user evidence forms. This is clearly problematic to the claim, as the assessment of the evidence thereafter was based on the premise that the alleged route did not cross the field to join the highway at home close. As this is a claim based on user evidence, it is particularly necessary to show that the alleged route joined or met a public highway. If not, then the question has to be, how did the public get to it and access it? In the absence of such a link, the inescapable conclusion is that use can only have existed through an act of trespass, in this case, across the field at home close. During the assessment of the evidence, your officers considered the alleged route plotted by the County Council Spatial Mapping Team and based on the applicant's confirmed plan. 
After due consideration, they were unable to show that it joined the public highway at any point. Indeed, this was clearly an isolated route, and for it to succeed, particularly on user evidence, it would need to be shown that such a connection had existed and was used. And it is at this point that we get the first case of disparity in the evidence. The applicant's own plan appears to show the circular route around the edge of the golf course, together with an added section, not in red, transversing the field at Horn Close. The problem is that this is not reflected in the applicant's letter confirming the line of the route, nor on the plan the spatial mapping team plotted from the evidence, nor indeed is it visible in some of the witness plans given in the user evidence forms. This is problematic as it clearly shows a lack of consistency not only in the user evidence but in the applicant's evidence itself. Inconsistency worries us or should worry us and in a case that is based on user evidence the scales immediately begin to tip away from a successful claim. Putting this lack of connection to the wider highway network to one side for a moment and turning to the circular route itself, we again find a disparity in the evidence. As members will note at Appendix C, the line of route varies within the user evidence plans. In some cases, it is quite significant and appears to include a second, smaller circular route on land adjoining its eastern edge. This is a ma major difference and is immediately apparent to anyone assessing the evidence and it does nothing to support the claim. What we are looking for is consistency, and what we cannot find is consistency. Even when the minor differences are considered, there is enough of them when taken together to tip the scales against the claim. And while in no way wishing to state the obvious, small discrepancies in the plans translate into quite substantial differences on the ground. These anomalies are referred in the re referenced in the report under the subheading Consideration of User Evidence Plans and may be found between points 55 and 106. Your officers have studied the plans in some detail, and although a general similarity in the overall route can be seen, there are too many anomalies along its length to say it is consistent. Taking this together with its isolation or detachment from the public highway, the scales tip ever further away from a successful claim. Turning to the other details revealed in the user evidence forms, we can see that a relevant 20-year period was indeed satisfied and identified as running from 1981 to 2001, and then this was the period during which the greatest use occurred. Of the 16 users who supplied evidence forms, half of them, 50%, testified to use throughout this 20-year period. Throughout the evidence, there appears to be some ambiguity over the alleged route and the existing definitive routes in the near vicinity, being public footpaths 20 Silverdale and 112 Newcastle. References are also made to signage along the route, and although there is a paucity of evidence, it is almost certain that these related to existing rights of way and not to the alleged route. The county would not, of course, install a finger post on a non-definitive route, and any unofficial signage would have been strictly illegitimate. However, the impassibility of these definitive routes is cited in the evidence as being a contributing factor to the use of the alternative or alleged route. Not only were the definitive routes obstructed by overgrowth, the alleged route was at times impassable due to flooding. Indeed, the variance of the line of the alleged route is suggested to have come about due to sections becoming flooded and inaccessible. The question of flooding was highlighted to your officers by the local member as a significant problem in this area, and although this in itself may not defeat the claim, it is duly noted. The line of the route is alleged to vary in the evidence sub submitted by Silverdale Parish Council, partly due to the activities of the junior golf course. The question naturally arises as to whether the activities of the landowner were affecting the route which people use. If so, then did this effectively interrupt, for want of a better word, the exact line which is the subject of the claim? Again, there is no further exposition on this point, although it is more probable than not that these hindrances to use, had they been suitably recorded, would have detracted from the claim. Other areas of the evidence do, however, support its use, as of right, throughout the relevant period. There were certainly no physical obstructions along the route, such as gates or fences, and no prohibitive signage or verbal altercations. It also appears that the route was used openly and with sufficient frequency to bring it to the attention of the landowner. Based solely on these points, it would have been possible to contend that the landowner had indeed shown an intention to dedicate the route, although the fundamental problem which we or more properly the applicant has, is twofold, as your officers have already elucidated, in that we have a disconnection from the highway and significant discrepancies in the attested line of the route. Following the circulation of the draft report, a number of comments were received, and your officers have included these very fully in the main body of the report, with later submissions being added to the addendum. 
I should say at once that this application has raised a lot of interest and on both sides. We have already heard that the local member endorses the officer's recommendation, as does Newcastle Underline Borough Council, whose comments can be found both at point nine of the report and at addendum point two. For clarity, the Borough Council objects to the application and has indeed submitted section 316 statutory declaration in 2020. This deposit, as members will be aware, will protect the land from rights of way applications for a period of 20 years, that is until 2040, when it will need to be reviewed again. Of course, it has no retrospective effect and therefore provides no defence against the relevant period of 1981 to 2001. And had the application been more consistent and joined the highway, then this alone would not have defeated the claim. Silverdale Parish Council also commented on the report and I would like to acknowledge their respectful contribution. Following several telephone conversations between your officers, the parish chair, Henrik Adamczyk, and councillor Celia Jarrett, it became evident how important this route actually was and is to the local community. They have submitted one of the most replete responses to a draft report to date, and this of course can be found in the addendum. As members will see, this response has, fi has been filed alongside your officers' comments and an exposition of each point has been noted. Although each point has been counted, there is one which is indeed open to interpretation, and that is the degree to which the user evidence plans differ. The parish chair suggests that there is a greater similarity between the routes than your officers have acknowledged, and that it was connected to the highway at Ashbourne Drive. This, is held, this it is held, tips the balance in favour of the application. Given the detailed and professional submission from Councillor Adamczyk, your officers did indeed go back to the evidence and once again assessed the plans. Firstly, we looked at the lines of the individual routes and compared them very carefully, section by section, and against the application plan. After much consideration, however, your officers could do no more than maintain their original stance and that the differences were significant enough to show a lack of consistency in the evidence. In exposition, some users were entering the woodland and some were not. Some were doing an extra loop at the eastern end and some were not. One at Appendix C4, for example, has the whole southern section of the route missing and others have significant differences at varying points. What your officers need to see is the same route being used consistently throughout the 20 year relevant period and that route connecting to a highway. Similarly, a link with Ashbourne Drive could not be ascertained with any degree of certainty and it was not indicated in the Form 1 of the application. For clarity, it should be noted here that the applicant's Form 1 did indeed refer to the section across the field from Horn Close, but that this was not carried forward through his confirmed plan or shown consistently within the user evidence forms. The count as submitted by Silverdale Parish Council was therefore one of the best we have seen and may have been enough to turn the case had the underpinning evidence in the original application been consist consistently presented. The matter elucidates very well the fact that the burden is on the applicant to prove his case and that accuracy and completeness are essential. As such, nothing turns on this. Lastly, members may have noted that some, but not all of the user evidence plans appear to join a small cul-de-sac network in the south. This is somewhat misleading as the roads and driveways shown are not part of the public highway. The section 53 application shown as LH620G on the western side of the route again appears to join the alleged route on one or two user evidence plans. However, this route has not yet been determined and so, as yet at least, does not exist in law. In summation, your officers can do no more than to uphold their original recommendation that the application be rejected for the reasons outlined in the report and reiterated above. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much <coughs> for a very full and evidenced report, um, uh, albeit the evidence that uh, it does seem that uh, th there's no consistency in the route. Right, Jill, do you want to say anything? Thank you, Chair. Um, just basically that um, I think it's been thoroughly investigated. It does seem a very... Um, uh, there's lots of evidence, lots of conflicting evidence, and it's very difficult to read it and take it all in. Um, but I, I do feel satisfied that it, it, was, it has been assessed twice. It's been reassessed. Um, and after the second assessment, the officers still couldn't uh, recommend and still must reject it. So um, I am in favour of supporting the recommendation. Thank you. We are a quasi-judicial panel. Our job is to listen to the evidence from both sides. Uh, 
make our own views on the evidence. And I think from what David has told us today, the way he's laid it all out from both sides, uh, we've got to go along with Box's recommendation. That is the stronger part of it. Uh, and uh, if Jill is proposing, then I will second uh, the uh, proposal that we go with Box's recommendation. We don't make a definitive order. Okay, just to confirm, there's a proposal from you, Jill. Yeah. David? Okay, so we've got a proposal and a seconder that we um, accept the um, officer's recommendation. Are we show of hands? Okay. <coughs> Thank you both very much for your time this morning. Okay, uh, we, I understand we've got no items of exclusion from the public on item number six. So uh, I declare the meeting closed at uh, 10.22. Uh, thank you all very much for attending and thank you for the, the support from officers. Thank you.